Next up, we have a really interesting talk about exploiting uh, the kernel on Apple's most recent systems, M1. So uh, let's give it a round of applause. Really excited to hear some of the research uh, Kay has done. And uh, I think also, we've, you're probably our youngest speaker and uh, furthest traveled. So that equally uh, deserves a round of applause as well. Um, thank you everyone for being here today and listening to my talk. This is my first time doing an in-person presentation. I'm so nervous right now. I'm probably going to make mistakes here and there. But next time I'll do better. All right, I'm, I'm honored to be here to give this talk and hopefully it's useful for some people. Today I'm going to talk about exploit vulnerabilities in Apple Video Encoder. Here's a brief information about this thing. So this video encoder component runs as a kernel extension, or you can call it a driver. It runs in the kernel space, so it has the same privilege as the kernel. It's a great target, however, only devices based on the ARM architecture will load this driver. And um, somebody said that the ARM CPU is better for video editing than Intel naturally. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it might have something to do with that, so they built a ded dedicated driver for video encoding on ARM. But anyway, just knowing that these vulnerabilities in, in this driver won't affect Intel Max is good enough. And now, let's take a look at this from the security perspective. Before Apple introduced the M1 chip, this video encoder driver used to be only exist on iOS. Most of this symbol got removed. The entire driver got mashed together inside iOS kernel cache. So it's a lot of work to sort out internal functions and re-symbolizing the kernel cache. And furthermore, you need a sandbox gate or jailbroken device just for debugging this driver. That makes it much less attractive target. But nevertheless, this driver once had received a lot of attention back in 2017. A researcher named Adam found a series of vulnerabilities in this driver, and the simplicity of these vulnerabilities is just absurd. Plus, from his slide, I believe back in 2017, Apple allowed direct access to this driver from inside a sandbox. And as someone who I have taken a deep look into his work, the moment I finally understood how these vulnerabilities work, it was mind blowing. It's crazy how simple they are. And now let me briefly explain them to you. So these are not race conditions or overflow problems. The cause of these vulnerabilities is there were no security measures it's a symbol that it's almost like the person who wrote the driver didn't think of the security aspect. And these vulnerabilities are really straightforward to trigger. And probably for a higher efficiency reason, tons of the interaction with this driver are done through memory mapping. A piece of kernel memory used by the video encoder has been mapped into user space to our process. We can read and write this memory whenever we want, and the changes we make will be reflected in the kernel with a very little delay. And so as the changes made by kernel would be reflected on our process memory. And because of this risky nature, when someone didn't take security into consideration, it becomes the source of the problem. Apple Video Encoder is a typical example. It writes kernel pointer directly into the memory shared with the user space, which creates all kinds of issues. This alone is enough to achieve code execution on devices that are not protected by the pointer authentication. However, that's not a focus of today. I want to emphasize something else that's way more interesting. Notice that the date here is 2017. In 2017, Apple patched a bunch of bugs from this same driver. You can see this screenshot got from Apple Security Advisory. It looks like a lot of work has been done, right? And um, Adam, the researcher who discovered these vulnerabilities, even published a post and presented at Black Hat talking about it. He did point out the weaknesses and how easy it is to exploit them. And since then, nobody ever mentioned this driver again. You can see how Adam described the code quality of this video driver. Uh, he said that neglecting basic security fundamentals. I guess many people probably had the same thought as me that this driver should be very secured after being through this kind of media exposure. In 2019, I was searching for new kernel vulnerabilities, and when I first stumbled across this driver, 
I googled his name and I saw Adam's discovery. I decided to stop the further analysis of this driver because I, I was thinking that the Apple must have reinforced this driver to a very secure level. And even if there is something left, someone else have, must have found it already. Adam's research article has made things much easier. Someone must have tried it. I don't want to waste time on the same thing. At the first glance, this driver looks quite complicated to me. I estimate that it would take a week of reverse engineering work just to learn internal and write code to test it. Um, so yeah, it's not worth just spending a week on this. That's exactly what I was thinking. But here's the thing. Apple is a company run and operated by people, which means it was a person inside Apple who read a report and did the patching work. And sometimes people are lazy. We don't want to put effort that's beyond necessary, especially when effort is not being appreciated. Adam has received a lot of credit for his work. I mean, he totally deserved it, but he made, a, he made a best effort to study this case to its full potential. But what about the person who fixed the bug? He didn't receive any credit. It might be even a girl, she didn't receive any credit for his work. I mean, yes, it's her job responsibility to, it's her job responsibility to fix the vulnerability, but, and she did get the job done. However, she wouldn't get any rewards regardless she'd done this work very well or just average. Both solution, both solution lists here work at the time, and it's easy to tell that the second solution is much more responsible and much more secure. And in fact, if Apple did a second solution back in 2017, I would never have a chance to exploit this driver. Despite all that, if you consider the human element, you'll find out that probably not many people are willing to spend that extra effort to make things more secure, because pretty much you can hardly find any incentive to do the second solution. Therefore, not many people understand our extra effort, and even fewer people appreciate extra, extra effort. The attacker is one of the few people who truly understand her effort to patch this vulnerability, but obviously the attacker would not appreciate her, would not appreciate her, because she, she makes the attacker's job more difficult. In real life, it's not as easy as a sound to patch a vulnerability, because it has to be practical. It's best to make minimum changes to avoid interference with the functionality. And as I mentioned earlier, this video driver is quite complicated, so if you make changes, you probably have to test it and make more changes to make sure everything works okay. So in terms of amount of work, it could be a difference between two days and a full month. So probably the first solution is more common in real life. That's just my opinion. <laughs> Anyhow, here's my advice for bug bounty. Always check how the bug's being fixed especially if you're the person who submitted a report. The patch may not as perfect as you think. You can be rewarded for being a little bit more responsible. Now, back to the video encoder driver. In 2017, by the time I discovered this driver, pretty much everything stayed, stayed intact. It's as powerful as it was in 2017. This video driver is a, it's like a hidden treasure waiting to be found, and the sandbox escape and a sandbox escape is the key for it. I end up report to a third party company and they reported to Apple. Fast forward to 2020, Apple fixed the part that I used to achieve clinical execution. A few powerful primitives are still there and the race condition is still there. Another sandbox escape is all it needs to jailbreak I was 13. And keep going, now it's I was 14 in 2021. For the first time, Apple brought this video driver onto macOS platform. They have made some major changes, but since it's macOS, driver fully symbolized and the sandbox, sandbox is not there by default. It feels great to do research on macOS. It's much less hassle compared to iOS. There was a lot of modifications happened to this driver, but these are the two most significant ones I found. The first thing I noticed is that a big chunk of code has been moved from a function to another function. I almost thought Apple rewrote all the code, which I find that hard to believe. But it turns out, nope, they just, they just moved the code. And here comes the second change, which does more than just moving code around. I'll explain it later. This is what it looks like on iOS 14 and the macOS Big Sur. Apple has broken all the primitives I had discovered in the past in the last major version, but they still didn't do anything about mapping. So the potential possibility of race conditions still exists. Um, my proof of concept exploit demonstrate that 
those kernel user map memory mapping scenarios are excellent targets for exploitation. Next, I'm going to review the new vulnerabilities I found and how they can be turned into a kernel read and write exploit. I have wrote everything down, so if you're really interested in the technical details, you can download a slide to study afterwards. Okay, so here is the first vulnerability. This is a triggering path. It's an overflow problem. They need to add boundary tracks. And this is how to utilize it to read kernel memory. I will publish expert code later so it will help to understand. All right, and here's the second vulnerability, the triggering path. It's a race condition problem. Leverage the new data structure. And this is the second part, also the last part. Okay, then we talk about how these bugs are being fixed. Technically, they have not been fixed. Apple didn't take action on the overflow problem. By that, I mean they didn't add a size of boundary checks, but something else they did this time effectively solved the race condition problem. Here's the code comparison for the patch. So they add a buffer between the use of the mapped memory. I don't know how this will affect the efficiency of the driver, but Apple only did this for a small part of the small part of the mapped memory, which is smart. They they should have done this three years ago. And so far I did not discover a new approach to exploit this driver. And regarding Apple Security Bounty. Um, I reported back in February 2021, and they just went quiet. There, there were people complaining about Apple security bounty, lack of communication, and long delays are very true. I sent them a couple emails after the CVE is out, but they never responded until the end of August. There was like three or four months with no news from them at all, and that's normal. You don't hear words from them doesn't mean your report has been ignored. They're just being slow. Eventually, they decided to award me 52 grand for this report, which is beyond my expectation. Apple is quite generous, in my opinion. And overall, I think Apple Security Bounty Program deserves a positive review. It has pros and cons, but you don't have to report to Apple after all. There are other options like ZDI, Zero Day Initiative. They're like the CarMax in the bug, bug, bug bounty program, <laughs> bug bounty world. It's a personal choice to accept the offer from the ZDI or going through Apple Security Bounty, which is slow but potentially much higher return. But in my opinion, Apple pays the most, and they let you publish details of the vulnerability wherever you want. So if I discover new vulnerabilities in the future, I would prefer to report them to Apple. And next, we're going to talk about the Sandbox. Sandbox is a security mechanism that has been there for a long time. Apple can decide what you can access from inside of Sandbox, and it gets more and more restricted over time. It's almost like it's a simple, simpler solution for patching a vulnerability. If you're interested in learning more about Sandbox, you can watch my Black Hat presentation. I did some st statistical analysis of the evolution of the Sandbox. Maybe you can check that out. But anyway, back then, security outside of Sandbox often got often got overlooked. Maybe it still is now, but it's hard to tell. Here's another great example to demonstrate stuff outside of Sandbox are not so good in security. This is in 2019, which is the time I started looking for vulnerabilities that cannot be reached from inside of Sandbox. This driver caught my attention because the external methods are not that complicated. One of them does memory copy, and it's kind of easy to tell that it's missing size check here. It's also very powerful. You can achieve kernel read and write with just only this vulnerability. I don't need a sandbox escape to reach this driver. And then this is my checklist for drivers that cannot be reached from inside of sandbox. You can create this list by yourself pretty easy. You just download the firmware, extract all the property files of the launch daemons, then run an app, try to connect every one of them. Meanwhile, use the console application to monitor the logs 
and then you will see a list of the noun access. It was at the time of I was 12, I wrote a program and ID scripts to help structurize IOK classes. Then I manu manually added the code, and those circling red are drivers that I found have problems. The details of the first three have been made public. You can find them on the internet. And then the last one, it's an interesting one. I have never reported to Apple. I was hoping I can make an exploit out of it, but I never succeeded. I'm going to introduce them today. The last version I checked is vulnerable was I was 14.0. Maybe it's still zeroed in right now. I'm not sure about that. So it exists in driver whose name is key delivery MSE. And as the consequence of this vulnerability, you get to overwrite a physical memory page with a controlled data. Doesn't that sound amazing? I would love to learn if anyone knows how to exploit this. I'm going to go through this quick because it's not really something new. In fact, it was actually quite a common type of kernel vulnerability a few years back, like back in Yosemite era. You set up two threads to run. One is calling external method. Another one is closing the client connection. Just keep trying until something magical happens. It's a race condition, essentially. And then here's the detail of this vulnerability. Basically, when the user client closes, it will clear the owner task variable. And in one of the external methods, it uses the same variable to create a memory descriptor to write data into a specific task. With race condition, we can clear the owner task variable before it's used to create a memory descriptor. And this way, everything remains the same except for the memory descriptor that's supposed to point out, supposed to point to the virtual memory of the task, but now it points to the physical memory. And it's hard to exploit this because you can't control the address it writes into the physical memory. And I don't really understand the format of the physical memory address. But this is but this one is really cool though. And then I wrote some highlights about the post exploitation. Overall, the security on macOS has been boosted a lot, especially on kernel level after the M1 chip, in, M1 chip has been introduced. And also, we see more user space vulnerabilities get published in the community. It gets so much more attention now compared to in the past. Um, so I believe the security is improving year after year. Um, and all right, this is the end of my talk. I really appreciate everyone here listening to my talk. Thank you so much. Yeah.